So folks from all corners of the state are here. Welcome to everybody. Um, Jody, could you advance the slide? Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Wolf. I am APNM's Chief Program Services Officer, and I'm delighted to welcome you all. You are the unsung heroes in animal welfare in New Mexico. Um, APNM is in a unique position. I know you all talk amongst yourselves, but we have the great privilege to hear from folks from all over the state. And Boy, we hear that things are really tough out there uh, for you working in this space from shelter overcrowding to the shortage of veterinarians and other veterinary professionals uh, <clears throat> to the rising costs of vet care, even pressure from the public. I mean, it's tough. And we know that spay neuter funding is part of the solution. So. We're just so delighted to have you here. I'd like to thank my colleague, Jody Beers, who is APNM's operations manager. She is um, on hand for any technical issues that might come up. And I am most uh, honored to welcome our presenter, Stacy Voss. Stacy is the chair of the Animal Sheltering Committee, which is under the New Mexico Board of Veterinary Medicine. Stacy is also the director of the Farmington Animal Regional, <clears throat> excuse me, Farmington Regional Animal Shelter. And also we wanted to congratulate Stacy on her recent certification as a certified animal welfare administrator, CAWA. This is a certification um, earned through the Association for Animal Welfare Advancement, a great accomplishment and um, congratulations, Stacy. Before I turn it over to Stacy, I'd like to give a little bit of background. It's mostly going to be a refresher for you of the state bill that actually created this funding mechanism, Senate Bill 57. And as many of you know, there is a lawsuit challenging uh, SB 57. So I wanted to give you an update on that. Um, then Stacy will present, and there will be time for questions at the end. Please type your questions in the Q and A rather than the chat. This will allow Stacy to see them, you know, as a list rather than hunt in the chat. So really appreciate if you could put your questions in the Q and A. And I'd like to thank my colleague Jessica Johnson Shelton in advance. Jessica is attending; she's an attendee with you all but she said that she would be waiting in the wings during Q&A if there are any legislative questions or legal questions that come up, Jessica can field those. So thanks for being here, Jessica. Um, also at the end, I'm going to be asking you all a few questions. So if, if you can stick around till the, the very end, I'd like to ask you some questions from APNM that will help APNM better serve you. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to provide a, um, Jody, could you go to the next slide, please? Is it not going? Oh, there we go. Okay, so about uh, New Mexico Senate Bill 57, um, I wanted to provide a reminder of the legislation that created this spay-neuter funding mechanism. And for this group, I'm sure I don't need to explain the companion animal overpopulation problem in New Mexico. Um, most of you work in this arena daily. Uh, and we all know that it is a problem that is both tragic and expensive. It's very costly to our communities, costing millions of dollars a year. And because this had been a problem for so many years, the New Mexico State Senate actually requested that a study be conducted, which um, was <clears throat> produced in 2012, to look at what would be the best, most effective, most equitable, and feasible funding source for statewide spay and neuter. And the study determined that that funding source would be charging a fee to pet food manufacturers that sell their products in New Mexico. And as you can see from this graphic on the screen, 
the bill had tremendous support from the sheltering community, from New Mexico counties, the Albuquerque Journal endorsed it, New Mexico Veterinary Medical Association, and it had widespread support. Um, <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So how does Senate Bill 57 work? The bill was passed in the 2020 legislative session and the New Mexico Department of Agriculture began collecting the pet food manufacturer fees in January of 2021. And there's a three year phase in period. So for that first year, they collected fees of $50 a year per product of dog and cat food treats, dog and cat food and treats registered to be sold in New Mexico. Then it went up to $75 per year per product <clears throat> the second year and 100 per product the third year. So you could see the bucket of available spay neuter funds increases. The fee does not apply to livestock feed. It doesn't apply to other companion animal food, such as for rabbits or hamsters. Um, it exempts prescription diets and also small manufacturers with revenues of 3 million or less are also exempt. And it's a, not a tax <clears throat> or a fee on retailers, retailers or consumers. Um, New Mexico became the fourth state to pass this type of bill following Maine, Maryland, and West Virginia. And on the right side of your screen, you can see how the revenue breaks down. <clears throat> um, the New Mexico Department of Agriculture takes 4% of the collected fees to enforce the fee registration. And then the fees are transferred to the vet board, the New Mexico Board of Veterinary Medicine, which can take 5% for enforcement of the Animal Sheltering Act and to administer the spay neuter funding distribution. So they're responsible for distributing it. And that leaves 91% for spay neuter surgeries for animals of income qualified families in New Mexico. So <clears throat> this was the plan. Next slide, please. Uh, and then as many of you know, there was a lawsuit um, filed challenging SB 57. I'd like to give you a brief update to, to bring us to the present. Um, in a nutshell, the legal action challenging SB 57 is still pending. Like I said, the lawsuit was filed in December 2020. Here we are, July 2023. Um, and I think it's important to say that things moving this slowly is normal in the courts. That's typical. And what's important is that the litigation, which could last months or even years, does not inhibit the rightful distribution of the spay neuter funds. So who's involved in this lawsuit? Uh, the plaintiffs, the ones filing the lawsuit, include the Pet Food Institute, the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council, New Mexico Chamber of Commerce, New Mexico Farm and Livestock Bureau, <clears throat> and the um, Rio Grande Kennel Club. And I think it's interesting to note that New Mexico is the first state to be sued by the pet industry interests. Um, we asked Maine, Maryland, and West Virginia, do they come after you too? No, New Mexico's the first. So we have the dubious distinction of that. Um, the defendants are uh, Governor Lujan Grisham, the New Mexico Attorney General, and the Secretary of the New Mexico Department of Ag. And I wanted to give a little timeline um, and thank you to Jessica Johnson Shelton for producing this for us. And she checked the case and all of that. So this is coming from Jessica, who is our chief government affairs officer. So in January of 2021, SB 57 took effect and the pet food manufacturing manufacturer fees were collected throughout the year by the Department of Ag. However, as many of you know, the department um, held the funds due to the lawsuit, due to their concern over the lawsuit. They wanted to wait to, to transfer them until they had greater clarity <clears throat> on the lawsuit. Um, as a consequence, and Stacy will probably go into this, 
the funds were not transferred to the vet board. So the 2021 grants came from the existing money that was in the animal care and facility fund. And that came from tax checkoffs and fees from the spay neuter license plates. So, you know, a year and a half later, uh, APNM and our partners had applied pressure to the Department of Ag to get them to the, release the funds to the vet board. And they finally did around May, June of 2022, transferring um, about $900,000 in collected spay neuter funds. So then fast forward to November of 2022, a federal judge ruled that uh, the federal court did not have jurisdiction over this case for some legal reasons and sent the case uh, back to state court, which is where it is now. Um, in April of this year, the defendants filed a motion to dismiss the case in state court. And where things are now is that the parties are now preparing and filing briefs for or against <clears throat> um, the motion to dismiss. And the judge will eventually rule on the motion when we don't know who will prevail in this lawsuit. We don't know. Um, however, in the meantime, the New Mexico Department of Ag did confirm that it would transfer the 2022 funds to the vet board by the end of the fiscal year, which was June 30th. <clears throat> and we have an inquiry into the Department of Ag to ask them, did, did you actually do it? Did it happen? And we're awaiting a uh, reply and uh, <clears throat> should hear very soon. So I hope that that overview gives you some good background and context without too many dizzying details. I know it's a lot. If you have further questions, um, again, please put them in the Q&A. <clears throat> and now I just like to um, once again uh, introduce Stacy and really acknowledge her leadership as chair of the Animal Sheltering Committee and the tireless work of the Animal Sheltering Committee members. They worked really hard in 2021 to develop the grant application, the grant guidelines, accept the applications, evaluate the, the, the applications, make recommendations to the vet board, um, all on a volunteer basis. They did a tremendous job and they're hard at work again. So Stacy, please take it away and share uh, what's going on. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you to everybody who's attending. I know it's been a journey and even behind the scenes, probably a longer journey. Um, and we desperately know how much spay neuter is needed in the state and um, how funding it is becoming more and more difficult as prices increase and veterinarians become in short supply. I'm, if uh, Jody can go to the next slide. Uh, oh, excuse me, Jody. You'll need to stop sharing and then, um, sorry. <clears throat> Stacy, can you share? Or you could email it to Jody. Oh, let me get it started here. Sorry, I was not prepared. Sorry about that. We have two batches. There we go. That work. Perfect. So I did want to address a little bit of the history um, and what in the world happened <laughs> the last few years. So, like Elizabeth mentioned, the previous funds that were dispersed, it was just over two hundred thousand. It's about two hundred eighteen thousand dollars, and that did come from the license plate checkoffs and, and other funds. It was not SB fifty seven funds. We were moving forward as a committee to start that process when the lawsuit happened and the funds were um, kind of withheld, but we decided to go ahead with the process to kind of get a trial run in, um, which was the perfect opportunity to learn some lessons, which we obviously did. Um, so that's what kind of happened. The previous funds were not technically SB 57 funds, but we kind of went through the process as a trial run as we would with the SB 57 funds um, to, to, like I said, just to get a kind of lay some groundwork for the previous years, because we were hopeful that we would be able to release funds, which we have. And then after APNM did put that pressure on the Department of Ag to release the funds, again, there's been a bit of a delay. 
going on. But what happened was the there's definitely been a change in, change in administration for the vet board office. Um, Fran Sowers did retire and Will Duran took over as their new executive director. And, and he could, took on quite a few quite a few things and projects. And then there was also a big change in the election year um, once Governor uh, Lujan Grisham was reelected, there was a big change in membership of the vet board. In fact, when I first started on the shelter committee, the whole entire vet board has changed except for two members. So there was a big change in administration and a change in the membership of the vet board. And on top of that, um, they redid the shelter committee as well. And that was late last year. And then the membership of the shelter committee is new as well. So I was retained and um, re-voted as chair. And then Dr. B. Hill from Albuquerque was um, brought on as well. So there was some congruent or some consistency in that. And then we have three new members, Christy DeSanctis, Diana Bell, and Dr. Tom Parker. So we are the five that make up the shelter committee now. So we just got that together, I think back in September or October was the final membership and we have been moving forward ever since. Um, the shelter committee, our role as we serve underneath the vet board, our role is very specific. It's to develop the criteria um, for those agencies or organizations to get the funds and then to make recommendations to the vet board for funding. We are not the administrators of the grant. The, the Board of Veterinary Medicine is actually the administrators of the grant uh, along with the, their, their office, the executive director in the office there. But the shelter committee's role is definitely to develop that criteria, kind of drive it forward. And then we've developed the application process and everything else. So, and then at the end of that, we make the recommendations for funding um, to the veterinary board, but they do have the final say in, in how that goes. So that's kind of the history and the process why it's, there's been such a delay and why it's taken so long, but there's a lot of new people involved and we're all really energized and excited. And it's definitely been a pr good priority um, for the vet board to get this done. And a special thank you to the old, old members of the shelter committee. We worked really hard in kind of our uncharted waters when we first started this, none of us had really done it before. So we learned a lot of lessons and struggled through it. And um, we were able to disperse that about $215,000. But we learned a lot when we saw the applications come in. And we actually had, as just a point of reference, over $900,000 worth of ask during that original application period. So that was, that was eye-opening as well, that we had that much um, an ask when it happened. I'm trying to figure out how to advance my own slides. There we go. So this is the new information for 2023 and the guidelines for the grant funding. So the bill is very, very specific. And a lot of our guideline and information comes directly from the bill. But who is eligible? Individuals are actually um, eligible to apply for funds. And I will get to that toward the end because that's a new wrinkle that we did not tackle the first time. Um, nonprofit organizations, animal shelters, and euthanasia agencies, which typically euthanasia agencies and animal shelters are the same thing. Um, but in order for funds to be given to nonprofits and to individuals, they have to meet the income verification or income requirements. The bill is, again, very specific. So we talked about this a lot in the new shelter committee. But the bill basically designates that nonprofit organizations have to be the ones that are also helping individuals. They can't necessarily use the funds to do their own animals. It has to be for owned animal. They're giving it to service recipients who meet these income guidelines. From the sounds of the way that the bill was written, um, that assistance can go to animal shelters and it sounds like that they can do their own animals, but nonprofit organizations have to be helping um, those individuals that meet those income requirements. So that chart and guideline are in the guidelines that are with the application. Um, it's the updated, they have to be within the 200% of the poverty guidelines and the person number of persons per household. So that's all outlined there. Um, for the income verification, that was a point of contention last time. Um, basically, we decided that this time once organizations are given or awarded a grant, we will actually include an affidavit that you can use for income verification. It was a, similar to a lot of organizations you did last year, but we're just gonna standardize it. And it is up to the, the individual organizations to verify that income with that affidavit and then move forward. We do not want copies of people's tax returns or any sort of that um, at the vet board office. They just wanna know that 
that the organizations are, are verifying that income and, and move on. Um, we're not asking for like to keep income records and things like that. So, so more of the information and guidelines, there's no minimum to the amount that you can request. We had everything from, I think about $5,000 all the way up to the max of $50,000 asked for last time. We did put the max at $50,000 again. Um, mainly the thought behind that was just trying to get the money um, dispersed throughout the state to as many projects as we could. And again, no, this is set in stone for this year, but it's not set in stone for the future. So we'll kind of see what happens. Um, vaccines are included this time, core vaccines, the, the DHPPV, the FVRCP and rabies um, for the animals up to $10, a cost of $10 per vaccines. We are still not including microchipping in the guidelines. We did want the money to go directly to those life-saving, um, to those surgeries and to the vaccines. Transportation may be included. This could be transportation for um, service providers if they're coming to an area where they nor don't normally travel. It can be transportation for if you're going around and helping individuals get their animals to the clinics. Um, but transportation can be included in the ask. Equipment, if you're looking at equipment to increase your spay and neuter capacity, such as surgery packs, um, or if you're looking for animal capture or housing equipment to be able to, again, extend, expand your ability to do spay and neuters, such things like feral cat traps, equipment up to $5,000 can be included as well. Anything over $5,000 is considered a capital expense and cannot be included in the ask for this grant. Uh, staffing and training may be included. Um, the staffing is very specific in the fact that it cannot be in perpetuity. It can only be for the um, time period of the grant. So if you're looking at contract work, if you're looking at hiring somebody just for the temporary um, amount of the grant to coordinate things, that can be included in your ask. And also high quality, high volume spay and neuter training is also included in the ask. So if you have a veterinarian or a staff already on board and you're looking to expand their skills and would like to use, ask for money to expand that and train them, that's more than welcome to be included in that as well. Um, marketing and educational materials, again, can be included in this cycle up to $500. The thought with a lot of that is, is there's a lot of need out there and it just kind of depends on we just want to make sure again that the, the majority of the money is going to the spay and neuter surgeries. This time we do not allow copays, so we want we do we want to increase decrease the amount of barriers that people had to get their animals or pets spayed and neutered. So sometimes even a twenty dollar or a fifty dollar copay um, can be a hindrance or a roadblock to the to that individuals, especially being underneath those poverty guidelines. So copays are not allowed in this cycle. Surcharges for surgeries such as like crypt orchids or pregnant or in heat surgeries are allowed up to $50 per surgery. Um, so it has, when you're doing your budgets, you have to be very specific about what that money is going toward and what's being charged. And this little pumpkin is available for adoption right now. <laughs> um, the grant requirements, the money has to be spent within 12 months of receiving the funds. So we're hoping to present to the vet board our recommendations for funding no later than mid-November. So hopefully that funding will be out by the end of this, this calendar year. And you would then have the 12 months to spend, spend the funds. Any money that might be left over at the end of that 12 months will, unless you ask for an extension or, or we work that out, will have to be given back to the vet board and go back into the, to the spay and neuter fund. When you're applying, you should have target areas or areas specific to what you're trying to target or service. Um, and it could be as small as a neighborhood, as big as a county. So uh, don't be too worried about that, but we do ask that you specify a target area. Residency requirements, the organizations have no residency requirements. Service providers have no residency requirements, but the individuals that are receiving assistance must be residents of New Mexico. So that is the only residency requirement is that, that the individuals receiving help have to be residents of New Mexico. Um, multiple organizations can partner together and apply. Um, there was actually 
I'll be really big, but there's one, there's a few organizations that got together and did a, a group application that was really, really good from the last cycle, if I remember correctly. And we hopefully made the application a little bit easier to be able to do that. Um, so if you do have multiple organizations, you are encouraged to partner up and apply together. Matching funds are definitely allowed. It's not a yes or no factor, but if you have matching funds, especially if we're not including microchips in this, if you have a different set pot of money that you can include microchips, you can consider that a matching fund. Um, and you have to be willing and able to report the numbers that you are doing. So you'll have quarterly reports that come out from the vet board office that will ask for the amount of money spent and the number of surgeries done or wherever that money went basically a detailed report saying how the money has been spent to date and how much you have remaining. So you have to be um, willing and able to do that as well. Some more application highlights. Um, good contact information with alternative contacts. There was kind of, with the change in the administration at the vet board office, there was actually a lot of people they couldn't get a hold of after the money was awarded. So make sure you give us good contact information with an alternative contact. So if, if there's turnover or somebody leaves that there's always somebody else that we can contact um, about those funds. We're gonna ask you for your organizational type. That was the same as last year, whether, whether you're a nonprofit, kind of spay and neuter organization, rescue organization, shelter, that type of thing. We are, we are going to ask for your mission. I think that's very enlightening to, to the types of organizations that are applying. Um, we ask for the source of funding, whether you're funded by donations or your municipality. Um, or you're funded through grants, whatever your source of funding is. If you are a facility that intakes and outtakes um, animals, we are going to ask for that information, um, how many you're intaking and how many and what are your outcome numbers as well, um, with the thought of trying to see uh, a little bit of what euthanasia rates are and that type of thing to take that into consideration. <clears throat> the individual applications, this is probably going to sound a little bit more confusing than I mean it to, but it's, it's how we worked things out. So when the shelter committee got together, we knew we had to tackle this idea of individuals being able to apply for funds. We had one um, do it the previous round, but that we were actually able to get them with an organization that was already in existence um, and they were able to help them out. So that was um, a good opportunity there. What we did not want to do is dictate private veterinarians and what care that they could give. That was just not going to be something that we were interested in doing. So what we did is we kind of, we got a range, we contacted several, several vet clinics throughout the state and got a range of what they were charging for um, their surgeries. And then we came up with the idea that we would, individuals could apply and there would be no um, deadline just as long as there's funds available, they could apply. And then they would be given an award letter and the award letter would state how many surgeries and the amount of money that they were awarded um, which they could then take to their local vet clinics or even not a local vet clinic, um, a private vet clinic, to then see if they could get the surgery done for that amount of money and if the veterinarian was willing to work with that and do that. And then the veterinarian at the end of the, end of the surgery would send in that basically for reimbursement, that word letter back in for reimbursement to get reimbursed for the amount of that surgery. So it's, it's really the person applying that has to do the legwork to find a veterinarian to get the surgery done. But this would be a great way to get those surgeries done or get those surgeries paid for in areas where there are no programs or there's very few programs or there's more private veterinarians um, than there are necessarily low cost programs. So again, the gamut ranged a lot for how much people were charging for these surgeries. And we know, we all know it's gone up in the last couple of years, but the individual applications um, will be capped at for a dog's for a cat spay. It'll be for, capped at four hundred dollars. We will not pay more than four hundred dollars per cat spay. For cat neuter, it's three hundred and fifty. And again, we realize that there are some places that are charging fifteen seventy five dollars, um, and there are some places that are charging five hundred or six hundred dollars. So we try to find somewhere in the upper middle range that will cover most surgeries or most procedures at private clinics. For dog spays, again, $600 and dog neuters, $500. Um, there are some clinics where this is not going to cover it, um, but then again, that individual can work with that veterinarian to see if they can make pay up the difference or if they could work something out to get the surgery done at that. 
Um, we are gonna do up to 15% of allotted funds to go toward the individual applications. And this is something that we're gonna need you guys, your help in spreading the word. Um, like if you guys are overwhelmed with your, um, with your programs that are, have super long waiting lists, this might be a way to get more individuals done. I know in, in, in my particular town, we have really long waiting lists and this might be a way to help people that have more emergent situations or again, that might have a little bit more wiggle room with what they can afford versus a free surgery. So the individual applications, we're gonna try it. Again, we've never done it before, um, but we're certainly gonna try it and see how it works. And, and it, we kind of have a theory of either nobody's gonna apply or everybody's gonna apply. So we don't really know what's gonna happen, um, but up to 15% of those allotted funds will go toward those individual applications. So we are being told that we're going to get up to $900,000 to disperse. And so that'd be about 100, um, just over 100,000, 115,000 um, for individuals. And again, we, we're not going to put a deadline on those individual applications. It's just going to be available as money is available. And the application for the individuals is really simple. Um, they just have to let us know what they need done and they have to certify what their income is that they meet those income requirements. Deadlines. So we're actually going to open up the organizational application. It's actually going to be available today. I'm really excited. <laughs> um, but the organization is Friday, September 1st um, at 11.59 p.m. That's the deadline that you would have to get it back into. Um, they do need to be submitted to will at the New Mexico Board of Veterinary Medicine. Um, the individual will have no deadline. Um, we'll accept applications as long as funds are available. And if nobody applies, we might redistribute those funds to organizations depending on how that goes. Um, they're working on the, the vet board is working on a new website. I believe the web address will remain the same as far as I know. However, they are having some problems with people downloading, um, sorry, downloading forms from the website. So you can email any of the, the folks at the vet board and they will email you back a copy of the application. It is in a fillable PDF form. I do ask that if the text box is not big enough for you to enter all your information to, just um, attach a separate form or a separate typed up sheet of paper um, to that, but you can get the applications from any folks at the vet board office and they will email those to you. And again, submit the applications by 11.59 p.m. on Friday, September 1st. And I feel like I'm missing a slide, but I don't know what happened to it. Oh, I'm gonna go back, to, sorry, I'm gonna go back to a slide. Ah. I did skip one, sorry. Again, going back to the applications um, for the organizations, the, what we're gonna also, what we're gonna ask for is the amount requested. Obviously you have to write the amount that you want. Um, there is a larger section for goals. Um, my advice is to be specific as you possibly can. We wanna know the numbers of surgeries that you're looking to do what you're looking to do them on. If you're only focusing on feral cats, if you're doing dogs and cats, or maybe just dogs, um, be very, very specific with those goals, um, with the numbers of surgeries planned and how you're going to do them and what you're going to spend the money on, how much the surgeries are gonna cost. We are going to ask for service providers who is going to be doing your surgeries. Um, we know there's a shortage of veterinarians. Um, we know it's tough. Um, but we are asking that you provide who's going to be doing the surgeries. Um, again, the locations targeted are served, um, we ask for as well, and the budget of the project. So when we talk about project, we're really talking about what you're going to spend the money on. So this, the, the funds, the grant funds should be done to increase your spay and neuter capacity um, and should not be used to replace funding that's already in place for spay and neuter. So we're hoping like if you're having two clinics a month, maybe this will give you three clinics a month. Or if you only can have one clinic a year, maybe this can give you two clinics a year. But include those, your specific goals in the budget with um, and how you're spending the money and being detailed as possible about your budget for your project and what the money is going toward is going to be helpful. Um, I will say there was a few applications that we saw the first round that were just like, give us some money and we'll see what we can do with it. And, and frankly, that's not probably going to get funded. Very specific projects that had 
we're using this vet, we plan on doing this many surgeries, here much, how, this is how much it's gonna cost per surgery, and we would like another $500 for cat traps. That, those are the type of projects that got funded that were very specific with their goals and have very specific budgets about where the money was going. I'm sorry I skipped that slide, my mouse is sticking. <laughs> so, um, so that's more application highlights. Um, again, you can get the applications from the vet board website or email these folks and they will send you the application. The application is ready and live. We are super excited about that. Um, APNM was actually a big help in converting those to a fillable PDF. We do ask that they are typed out and not written out just because it's really hard to read sometimes, but type those out as well as you can. And then the individual application will be available as well. And we're getting those, again, thanks to APNM, we are getting those translated into Spanish and they will be available in Spanish. There's just been a slight delay. So those aren't quite available yet, but they will be shortly. Um, what else do I got? So submit the applications. There's a deadline by Friday, September 1st. Um, and again, we hope to make the recommendations to the vet board for funding no later than mid-November. And then hopefully the funding will be sent out um, shortly after that, hopefully by the end of the, the calendar year. Um, my contact information is there. If you do have any um, extra questions, if you need anything, I will help as much as I can. Um, I am with the city of Farmington and that is my office phone and, and email. And then I guess while I have everybody's attention, I'll get to the Q&A here in just a second. But while I have everybody's attention, there is a, bud, uh, a, a growing group of shelter leadership um, coalition that is growing in New Mexico. We're called the New Mexicans, New Mexico Companion Animal Network. If anybody is interested in that as well, um, definitely give me a shout out email um, and I will connect you to that group. But we are trying to tackle some of these bigger problems like spay and neuter uh, and how to get groups in here to get spay and neuter done, funding, all that good stuff. And then we're just a group of compassionate, collaborative people that we want to improve the situation for animal welfare in the state of New Mexico. And we're, like I said, we're the shelter directors or shelter leaders on the ground, kind of doing the, some of the dirty work. Um, and if anybody's interested in that coalition, please let me know. Like I said, which I have everybody's attention, I'll plug that as well. So I will get to the Q&A here and see. So Susan asked how much will be transferred. So we are gonna be able to disperse about $900,000. Again, that's from the previous year. So we might be able to turn around depending on if they've released the next round of funds. Hopefully we'll be able to turn around and get another set of projects going shortly after that, but we will have $900,000 to disperse. Are tribes able to apply for funds if we work with an animal shelter or entity for spay and neuter? Yes, you would be. Tribes are able to apply for funds, if, especially if you work with an animal shelter or entity for spay and neuter, that would be perfect. Can shelters give to individuals or use it for individual animals? Yes, yeah, shelters can use it for individuals, animals. They are, they just have to meet those federal poverty guidelines, but certainly they can give that, um, give that aid to individuals as well. Um, yes, tribal communities can apply for this grant. They just have to live in New Mexico or be in New Mexico. The individual application is for actual individuals. So if you happen to have a pet and you need it spayed or neutered and you meet those federal poverty guidelines, you can apply to get months, funds to get your pet spayed and neutered. It has, you do not have to go through an organization. You do not have to go through a spay and neuter program. It's just your individual resident who needs help getting their animal altered. Um, so that's, that's a different twist, something we haven't done before, but I'm hoping it works out well. I'm especially hoping it works in my community. <laughs> um, yes, individuals can use that shelter if the shelter allows. Um, will individual recipients need to provide a receipt showing what they actually paid for the surgeries? No, the, the money is never gonna go to the individual. The money is actually gonna go directly to the vet clinic. So the, the individual research will receive an award letter that they'll then, then take to, the, to their vet clinic to show that yes, I have the, these funds are available, the surgery will be paid for, and then the vet clinic will contact the vet board for reimbursement for that surgery. So the individuals actually won't be getting physical money. It's gonna be the, the vet, veterinary clinic will be the go-between. And we will use the vet board resources to reach out to vet clinics to let them know what's going on. And hopefully that they'll, will be interested in um, helping out. But 
hopefully a lot of it, like I said, it was covered and they're not gonna actually lose any money. Um, so that would be kind of cool as well. Could we purchase or rent a mobile spay neuter van with this? Purchasing, no, because that's more of a capital expense that's over the $5,000 for equipment. Renting a mobile unit should be included in that. If that's, the, if that's how you're going to get the surgeries done, then that would be certainly included in doing that. But the purchasing of a van um, would be considered a capital expense and cannot be included in asking these funds. Service providers. In our town, we have two available vets in Trinidad, Colorado, 17 miles away, in addition to our three in Raton. Would we be able to conclude the Trinidad, Colorado vets in the application? Yes. So there is no residency requirements for those service providers. So if you're bringing in um, a group from Colorado, if you're bringing in a group from Utah, if you have a spay neuter specialist from Texas coming over for a weekend, you can definitely pay them with these funds. It's just the, the service recipients, the individuals that you are helping have to be residents of New Mexico, but that's the only residency, residency requirements there are. I know there are even organizations up in Colorado um, that are based in Colorado that come down here and do spay and neuter. So they could even apply being Colorado residents, they can apply. It's just the people that they are helping and the pets they are spay and neutering have to be residents of New Mexico. Um, well, the individual recipients need to provide receipts showing what they actually, oh, I answered that one. Okay, done. Uh, did you say that once the applications are approved, money will hopefully be distributed November, December of 2023? Yes, that is my hope. Um, I'm probably putting Will on the spot a little bit, but I think if we can hit our timeline, and I've been pretty pushy about our timeline, um, if we can hit that timeline, of recommending to the vet board about mid-November, I don't see a reason why it shouldn't happen by the end of December. So yes, we are definitely hoping for that. Things happen as we have seen and we have lived through on almost on a daily basis, but that's, that's kind of the idea. Um, could you provide an example of a budget for applying a nonprofit organization? Yes, there's actually in the guidelines that come with the application, there's actually a little sample budget at the end. So that is actually included in the paper version. Sorry, I didn't include that here, um, but it basically just breaks down, um, again, where the money is being spent and how the money is being spent. So that's included in the guidelines. And if you have any more questions, definitely reach out to me if, after seeing that, if you have more questions. Um, where on the website are the applications? They might not be on the website just yet. Um, like I said, they're working on exactly this morning, changing over the website to be able to do that. So if they're not, they should be somewhere. It'll be on the very first part or under the shelter committee stuff. But if it's not there, you can email those folks and they will get the application to you. Um, yeah, again, about when will the, the funds actually be in our hands? I can't guarantee that, but I would hope that by the end of December, they would it would be in your hands. Can you please explain the copays again as we do charge a copay to help cover our cost? Certainly. Um, so for this particular this particular grant cycle, we're saying copays are not allowed. So if you're going to be using these funds, we're asking that you not charge a copay. Um, I realize people charge a lot of charge the copays to get kind of the money to stretch further. We totally understand that, but we did not want that to be a barrier to individuals getting their animals done. Like I said, at this at this point in time, even a ten, twenty dollar, fifty dollar copay could be prohibitive for some people. So we're not allowing copays. So if you're using, if you wanted to come up with a project or use it this for a specific clinic, you could do that and just not charge co-pays at that clinic. Um, so if you have questions about that, let me know, but we are not allowing co-pays at this time, but if there is a surcharge, like some, some vets do charge like an extra $50 for a crypt orchid or $50 for an inheat or pregnant spay, that is allowed. Um, by shelter, do you mean municipal shelter? It could be municipal or nonprofit shelter. So as long as you have a 501c3, um, designation or you're a municipal shelter or slash government agency, you are allowed to apply for funds. 
Also, just to clarify, Albuquerque City Shelter could only receive up to $50,000. Correct. So there is the max of $50,000 for this grant cycle per project. So one organization can only apply up to $50,000. Can a municipality apply to assist with spay and neuter animals we are housing in our shelter? I'm gonna say yes. So it's the bill is a little vaguely written, but um, the way we have interpreted the bill that yes, if you're a municipal shelter that you can apply for funds to spay and neuter your shelter animals that are not owned by anybody. So yes. <laughs> yeah, the link, we don't have a link yet, I'm sorry. Um, so it sounds like the grant applications are not live on the website yet. They will be shortly, but if they are not live, email, um, and they will get them, get those to you. And I will go back to those email addresses, email William, Deborah, or Catherine, and they are prepared to send you, email you back the application. If we get a specific link, we will definitely send that out as soon as we get it live. Um, what is the info for the New Mexico CAN group again? Um, we, we don't have any official website yet. We will shortly just email me and I can definitely talk to you about it and, and get you involved or get you on the email list. So if you're interested in the New Mexican kind of shelter leadership group, um, just email me and let me know. You can also email Elizabeth, she's well connected to us, but she'll probably pass your information on to me. <laughs> um, your year is December through January. Well, for this, yes, most fiscal years, I think the New Mexico Board of Veterinary Medicine, their fiscal year is July 1 through June 30th, but I'm saying calendar year that we're gonna try and get the funds out by the end of this calendar year. We aren't really, we as the shelter committee aren't really regulated by a fiscal year as far as when we can disperse the funds, but um, for applications, I'm saying this calendar year, but it's a different than fiscal year. Can this money be used for any 2023 spay and neuters done previous to receiving funds or only for procedures done after receiving funds? This would have to be new procedures. This cannot be used for things that were already done. Again, this funding is supposed to be used to be increasing spay and neuter, um, not necessarily replacing funds that are already there for spay and neuter. So this is all new projects or new, new surgeries that would need to be done after receiving the funding. So nonprofit shelters can use for their shelter pets. <sighs> I'm gonna read you guys directly what it says because it's really confusing and that's what I have to go off of. But assistance, provided that assistance to individuals and nonprofit organizations shall only be given to individuals who have or to nonprofit organizations that shall only provide assistance to service recipients who have a household income that does not exceed the 200% of the current federal poverty guidelines. So again, the interpretation that we are using of that is that assistance to individuals and nonprofit organizations can only give assistance to individuals who meet those poverty guidelines. I know it's super confusing. I've read it 5 million times. But yes, municipal shelters, can use it for their own animals. The way we're interpreting that is municipal shelters can use that for their own animals. But given that statement, that nonprofit organizations shall only be given to individuals who have or to, to nonprofit organizations shall only provide assistance to service recipients who have that income, household income that does not exceed 200% of the federal poverty guidelines. That means if you are a nonprofit organization, you would need to be helping individual pet owners and not necessarily your own animals. A little bit different situation for municipal shelters. It did not designate, the bill does not designate that in any particular way. Again, I know it's confusing and I apologize, but I did not write it. <laughs> Just have to interpret it. Um, can a municipality apply and then fund a nonprofit? It depends on what you're funding. You can't fund a nonprofit, you can do surgeries. I, so I guess I don't really understand that question very well. Um, but again, the budget that you're going to put in your proposal has to be very specific about where the funding is going. So if you're helping individuals or you're partnering with a nonprofit to get help individuals get their animals done, 
then yes. But again, be very, very specific on your application in order to say where the money is going. Um, logged on a little late, but my question, will the funding cover needed equipment for inside of the facility, such as shelves, storage equipment, et cetera? It can. Um, equipment asks are allowed up to $5,000. Once a piece of equipment costs over $5,000, it's considered a capital expense and not included in that. So if, if it should be something that's asked for, equipment should be relevant to getting the surgeries done or increasing your capacity for surgeries or animal transport or housing. So like again, surgery packs, spiral traps, spiral dens, that type of thing um, is what the equipment money sh sh should go toward. We are required to charge a $5 license fee for city and county per contract with the municipality. Would that be considered a copay? No, if, you're, if the license fee is for a license, that's not a copay for the surgery. That's just a license required by um, by your ordinance. So as long as it's not a $5 surgery fee, you're, you're okay with that one. Um, we are a nonprofit shelter. Once an animal is adopted, could the new owner apply for these funds? Yes, they could. If you are a nonprofit shelter, once an animal is adopted, the new owner could apply for these funds as long as they meet those federal poverty guidelines. So yes, that is a great question. So we are a private nonprofit animal shelter. Could we use the funding to spay and neuter our shelter pets? Again, I'm gonna say no. However, the way around that is what the question I just answered. Once the individual has adopted and your help and has adopted that animal and that animal is now owned and they meet those federal poverty guidelines, then yes, you can apply for funds to spay and neuter that animal for that owner, if that makes sense. So there's ways to, again, design your project and design it so that you're helping those individuals. But again, the way the bill is written, nonprofit organizations cannot necessarily apply for funds to do their own animals, but they can apply for funds to help individuals who own animals that meet those property guidelines. Um, sorry, there's We only allowed surgeries on feral cats that were owned, at least cared for by a specific individual who qualified the income. Any larger ways we could include feral spays and neuters? Yes, actually it is in the guidelines that feral or free roaming animals are included in the funding. Um, just be cognizant of local ordinances. But yes, for feral or free roaming, you can definitely apply for funds to spay and neuter those. Um, Okay, so if we implemented a voucher program using community vets, can we include an admin staffing fee as part of the grant application? I'm, that's taking my brain a second too. I think if you were including that in the staffing portion, so there is, if, if you needed money to fund that staff person, yes, that is what we have said can be included, that staffing can be included, or if you're contracting with somebody to, like I said, help during that, that program. Yes, it's just not gonna be in perpetuity. It's only gonna be for the 12 months of the grant period if you apply for funding or get funding that will allow for that 12 months. So if you're looking at contract staff or, or there's certain ways that that needs to be clarified before I can truly answer that question, but staffing is allowed again, up to the amount of the time that the grant goes for. Um, Okay, and then Sunny had a question about, this is more of, a, probably more of a philosophical question, but why is the state of New Mexico with the highest rate of pet abandonment in the U.S.? It doesn't seem like people get the need for spay and neuter, and what can be done during this grant campaign to get the word out? Um, I will say, and talking with people around the state and definitely based off of my own experience, people are waiting in line to get spayed and neutered. There has not really been that hard problem of trying to get people to spay and neuter. There's always gonna be those people that are, don't get me wrong, there are going to be those people that are harder to reach that don't want to spay and neuter, that have horrible reasons for not wanting to spay and neuter. Um, but the majority that, of 
my community members and community members that I've seen across the state are interested in spay and neuter. They just might not be financially able to get that surgery or other things come up or who knows what all the excuses are. But in general, people are very, very interested in getting this. It's just, we are in a unique position. Our state is a unique and wonderful, wonderful state, but we do have our, a unique set of problems. There are several areas in the state that are very rural, very spread out. Um, vet clinics and veterinary care are hard to find or you have to travel for. I frankly am right next to Navajo Nation. The, the Navajo Nation is the size of West Virginia and there are two vets on the entire nation. Um, and so being in a community that's next to the Navajo Nation, we get, we get recipients from, from two to three hours away just to come to a vet clinic here. Um, and I know it's like that in other places in rural New Mexico. So I think there are definitely people that are willing and able to get their animals done. There's just some, some roadblocks and hurdles that people have to get over. Um, we did include out marketing and outreach, again, up to $500 for organizations to use. I know that's not a lot, but um, if there's specific ways that people can use that money to reach maybe those those people that are harder to reach, that would be great. We'd love to see that. What these funds and what the shelter committee is really um, doing is providing the mechanism to get funding. And we're looking at these, at you groups, at these groups to take the advocacy and, and, and take it the next step. I know probably New Mexicans and like I said, some of these organizations are, are more into the ad advocacy and getting the word out. And the shelter committee is really, we're just kind of administering or helping to administer these funds and making the recommendations and hearing from you all how we can make it better or how we can change um, the process so that it's easier for everybody to get the money out. But again, from my experience, people wanna do the right things. There's just a lot of um, barriers to them doing it. And it might seem like a few bad apples ruins the whole barrel, um, but there are definitely more people good than, than bad out there. And we've all seen and felt this past year, the effects of not going gung ho on spay and neuter. Um, you know, in 2020 and 2021, we weren't able to, and, and we're slowly rebuilding that, but we're feeling the effects of that. So I know nobody wants to go backwards. Um, and it seems like we have, but nobody wants to go backwards. So hopefully, this funding will get us the jolt we need to move forward, and we won't feel those quite strong of effects of, of not being able to spay and neuter for a few years. So again, sorry, that was a little philosophical answer there, but hopefully that answers that question. Um, there's a few more questions that just came in. Um, will there be any advertising done by the board to let people who have the funding through this, through this grant? So again, the, the or individual organizations are or should be doing the advertising that they have funds available and can help people with spay and neuter. For the individuals, we are gonna do a press release um, eventually about both sets of funds for organizations and for individuals. Um, but then really we're gonna help, APNM is gonna help I'm sure. And then our coalition of um, shelter directors is gonna help, we'll get the word out about the individual applications. And again, you guys are, everybody on this call are boots on the ground working it doing things every day can tell people, hey, we can't, maybe we can't help you, but here you can apply for these funds. I mean, we, we take phone calls every day that, yeah, we're not taking applications right now for spay and neuter because we're booked through September, but here's two other organizations you can try. So I think we're all doing that every day, um, but there's no real plans other than the press release, this town hall, and then just, just using our, our, our animal welfare networks around the state to get the word out. Um, does the affidavit take the place of our agency requiring some sort of in income verification provided by the individual? So yes and, and no. What you can use the affidavit to, to verify, but if you want to do an extra level of verify, like if you don't want to take people's word for it or whatever, you, whatever you're comfortable doing as an organization to verify that income is what you need to do, but you will be provided with an affidavit that, that you can use that just says, they're basically signing the affidavit saying that yes, they, they meet those, those federal gui guidelines. If you would like to go a step further and verify income with enrollment in a federal program or seeing tax returns or something like that, you're, you're more than welcome to as, as well. I think, 
I think that's we're done <laughs> with the questions. If that's all the questions I have in the queue, I was not monitoring the chat whatsoever. So if Elizabeth, I don't know if anybody was monitoring the chat, if there's other questions in the chat, but um, like I said, the committee has worked really hard and um, trying to do the best that we can. And if there is feedback too, as we go through this process, please don't hesitate to give us feedback. Um, we don't want it to be confusing. We don't want it to be difficult. We want it to be fairly smooth process, but again, we just need the information so that we can make the right decisions about where the funding should go because the funding is limited. $900,000 seems like a lot of money, um, but we know it doesn't go as far as we need it to. Um, and hopefully there'll be the lawsuit will be over and we can move forward and have regular funding and it's an even better process. A um, couple more questions that just popped up. Can, you miss, can multiple groups from the same region apply? Yes, please do. Um, we tried to make it easier so that multiple organizations can apply with the same application. Um, but yes, you can definitely certainly partner up and apply together. In fact, I would actually encourage it if possible. So a nonprofit applying for funds needs to get each individual they're helping to sign an affidavit. Yes. So all individuals or people that are being helped need to have their income verified. So yes, applying for funds needs to get each individual they're helping to sign an affidavit at the time of surgery. You don't need to do it ahead of time, but if you're doing this before you sign people up or before you sign schedule them for surgery, they need to um, verify their income because all individuals, no matter if they're through the individual application or organizations are helping them, need to be under those federal poverty guidelines. So our clients are homeless, so have no income. Great, have them sign the affidavit that they have no income and you're good to go. That's all you have to do. We don't, again, we don't want that to be an arduous process. We're not asking you to keep people's tax records or anything like that. Um, you can if you want to, but that's not been a requirement for, from the vet board or from the administrators. Any other questions I'll throw up? Um, my contact information one more time. Feel free, I'm never in my office, but if you leave me a voicemail, I will call you back. Email works really good. Um, this is the longest I think I've been in my office for a while. And then again, those emails from the vet board office and those emails should be on the vet board website. The application should be live on the vet board website soon. Um, but again, you can email and get those applications and they are due September 1st for organizations. Stacy, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you very, very much for that information. See folks, before you go, I have a couple questions for you. <clears throat> One is, and this actually came out of a, a New Mexican <clears throat> meeting which APNM attends as kind of an asso associate member, <clears throat> but the um, the group is sheltered leadership, as Stacy mentioned, that we're trying to figure out who does perhaps have extra spay neuter capacity. Do people know providers who might be able to take on extra work, maybe weekend, maybe retired uh, veterinarians coming out of retirement temporarily or what have you. So that would be super helpful if you could share that information with Stacy of spay neuter providers who might be able to take on extra work. Um, my second question is, I know a uh, wonderful Jane Carson with PAWS mobile spay neuter unit is on this call. We've gotten several questions about what is what is the mobile capacity in New Mexico. So again, if you um, if if you're a group or if you know of other uh, spay neuter mobile rigs, <clears throat> we would love to get that information. Um, say, Jody, could you put my email address in the chat, um, Elizabeth at apnm.org? Would would that be possible? because then folks could send me the information and I could send it on and you could also um, flood uh, Stacy's inbox if that's okay, Stacy, because that's her contact info was up. The third thing I wanted to share with you is that as some of you might know, APNM has a spay neuter, statewide spay neuter resource directory online on our website and we're updating it, thank goodness. 
Um, so a couple things. One, anticipate a phone call about that, and we would love your participation. I know it's hard to take time out of your day to be interviewed, but it really, really helps to get that information updated. And I also would put out a call if anybody is interested in helping me, um, at if anybody's interested in volunteering to help update that spay neuter resource directory, I would really appreciate hearing from you. It's a big job, as you might imagine. It has to be done well and accurately, and we could really use the help because APNM is understaffed. Um, and I see that Jane Carson has raised her hand. And Jane, I'm going to try to unmute you. Hang on one second. Okay, Jane, if you can unmute yourself, you can uh, say your, your comment. Okay, thank you. I want to thank Stacy, who is a star shine in this state, and you too, Elizabeth, for the webinar. But uh, I really want to tell you that I'm getting this new mobile, hoping that Dr. Parker and our team can go a wider range than we have in the past. But in addition, if anyone in the state, anyone who is really passionate and can, <clears throat> you know, manage a mobile, I am willing to help build a mobile for them with the trailer. It's very, it's not rocket science and, um, and it meets the state standards. So, cause I would never want to hurt an animal or put them in a situation that wasn't appropriate. So that being said, with your committee, Stacy, um, what is the name of it? Uh, anyway, whatever you guys are, that's, I'm glad that you're sticking together. Uh, we've been through this before, but I think with you, it will happen. <clears throat> so if you uh, meet anyone who wants to do a spay neuter, let me know and I will walk them through it or come down to them or whatever we need to do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Jane, and congratulations on getting that that new uh, mobile rig. That's Yee wonderful news. Yoo hoo! <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Jane. I know you you've been the leader in the state for so long, and just looking to you as an example. So I appreciate you reaching out and wanting to help, and 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 thank you so much for your kind words. And Laura, it looks like you were asking for Jane Carson's contact info. Jane Carson is with PAWS, P-A-W-S. Uh, I don't have your email on me, Jane, um, but you could Google that website and Jane's email is right there or email me and I'll email it to you later. <clears throat> and Okay, and Judy Curtis, thank you for that that message. We will be able to save all of these comments. Um, and yes, we definitely need an all state directory update. Uh, Misha, we couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. We would really appreciate volunteer assistance with that. So please reach out. Anybody who wants to help okay. me uh, work on that would be really appreciated. So, all right. Well, I think with that, Jessica, thank you for waiting in the wings. Jody, thank you so much for your technical support. And Stacy, that was just so wonderful. It's great to see this uh, grant cycle opening. And um, we will look for the applications on the Vet Board website. And uh, we'll all be in touch in the coming months, I'm sure. So thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for your attendance and your interest and for everything you do for animals in New Mexico. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay.